we now have 38 paid up members and only those 38 members were invited to this meeting. The current shortfall between the cost of the license and the members' contributions is only 320 Rand, which means if we get five additional members to contribute the 71 Rand towards the license, we have covered our, uh, our costs for the year up to September 2021. Thank you to everyone who did contribute, all of you who are here. Um, also mentioned in the newsletter number five, the majority of you voted that we do have a meeting in, the December, uh, in December and most of you voted for the date of 16th of December at 10 a.m. Um, so I'm, I'm planning towards that. It will be a shorter meeting with only one topic and I will provide more detail in a future newsletter of exactly what we plan. Then at the end of the meeting there will again be a short survey like usual um, to track all the attendees. That's the only way I can keep record of who actually attend the meetings. Um, there's also You will also have the opportunity to rate the meeting overall and the two presenters in the survey. The first topic is cloud computing and storage by Derek. Now, most of you are familiar with Derek von Eren. He was a presenter at both the August and the September meetings. Derek is a great support for me uh, with this special interest group. He even contributed to our Zoom license. And I look forward to another well-researched presentation by Derek. Derek, over to you. Can you share? I think I've, yeah, I've enabled that. Good. So it's good to see everyone again. By now, some of the faces have become quite familiar, um, especially the ones that uh, tend to ask questions. So if you want to be remembered, um, when we get to the end, put your hands up and, and ask a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to talk about cloud computing today. It is uh, it is a term that we have mentioned in some of the previous presentations that I did around some of the uh, uh, third and fourth industrial revolution terminology. Um, and today we'll delve into the cloud computing side of things. So um, why cloud computing? Uh, with the coming of the internet, it was often, uh, the internet itself was often represented as a cloud on, on diagrams. And uh, as time passed, uh, it became more and more prevalent to just use the term cloud when people would, be, would refer to these functions that are presented and provided over the internet. Um, cloud has enabled a lot of things for us um, over time. If I quickly just check here, Johan showed me something yesterday, which was quite interesting. So you can see uh, I've got my darkies, my shades on now. Um, that is a function that is provided by a cloud service. I actually, I'm actually not wearing everything, anything, it's obvious. And you can see by the cartoonish look of that. But you can turn things such as that on and off. And all of these functions that, that are provided to us typically don't live on our machines. They live somewhere out in the cloud. Um, and we are, as users, are able to use those. So uh, from an overview perspective, what are we going to talk about today? I'll give you an overview of a couple of definitions of what different people say and think about what is the cloud. We'll talk about uh, businesses and why they have adopted the cloud and why they are using the cloud. We'll look at how they deploy the cloud within their organizations. And then we'll skip on to the personal side of things, uh, each and every one of us. Why would we want to use the cloud? Um, how does it look when we use some of these applications that make use of, of cloud services? And then lastly, we'll just look at a couple of options uh, in terms of what is available to us as users out there. So firstly, uh, if we look at, at the definition of cloud, um, I've just, there are many, many definitions uh, on, on the internet. I've just gone and extracted a couple that are not too elaborate and, and fairly simple. Um, so the first one that you see here is from uh, Wikipedia that we all know, the free uh, encyclopedia, um, which, which lives on the cloud and is contributed to by users uh, in, that uh, also uh, um, 
use the functionality from their, from their homes and in the cloud. So Wikipedia says that cloud computing is the on-demand availability of computer resources without direct and active management by the user. So when they are referring to without direct and active management by the user, they are actually referring to the bits that is not on your desk that lives out there in the cloud. I've highlighted a couple of terms there in these definitions that you might see them repeating, such as here on demand, computer resources. Uh, if we look at the next one, I've extracted a definition from Microsoft. They say cloud computing is the delivery of computing services over the internet, once again, or the cloud to offer faster innovation flexible resources and economies of scale. Um, Amazon, another big player in cloud services today, a uh, definition that I got off their website, cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay as you go pricing. So I've taken all of those and I've just summarized it into something short that I think summarizes all of that in short, clear, easy language. Um, and the important bits once again are highlighted there. So um, I've just said it's the delivery of flexible computing services over the internet on a pay per use basis. So let's have a look at why do businesses adopt cloud and why have they adopt cloud, uh, adopted cloud. Um, typically when you speak to somebody about cloud and why a business should, should be using cloud, one of the first things that come up is cost. So they speak about the billing model and they speak about economies of scale and they compare that to how things used to be done in the old days and what the benefits are of cloud. And uh, we'll go into some of those, the detail on that. But there's also other reasons why organizations have adopted cloud. It's not just purely driven by cost. So a big driver for organizations have been things such as flexibility, rapid deployment, on-demand deployment, um, those are things that in the traditional sense was not easy. It used to take many, many days, weeks, months, even years to deploy new applications or functions. Um, and nowadays it's, it's fairly easy. You can add the stuff, you can take them away, you can throw them away. Uh, you don't, haven't necessarily wasted any money by doing that. Uh, very, very flexible, rapid and accessible on demand. Uh, the cloud also provides the businesses with easy connectivity. Uh, most of us these days are connected to the internet. In the old days, if one business wanted to connect to another, um, it would have to apply for a direct line to be installed. Uh, Telcom would send out a truck, they would dig a trench, lay a cable, connect it up, uh, set up your billing, test it, and eventually those two organizations would be able to speak to each other. Today with the internet and a lot of the functionality that is provided by the cloud, that has become very easy. It's a click of a couple of buttons, obviously, or often, and people can uh, communicate with each other from a, from a uh, application perspective. Um, collaboration is also a big driver of why people have adopted the cloud, especially in businesses. Nowadays, you guys know what has happened with COVID. Um, sorry, Johan, I've lost my window. Just give me a So Johan, we have a chat uh, a comment. I see that uh, Louise is asking how to increase the volume. Um, Louise, all I can think of is something on your side. You will have to turn up your volume. Um, if you look at the bottom right of your taskbar, there's usually a little loudspeaker. If you click on that, you can turn it up. If it's already 100% up, then I'm not sure why. Uh, I can hear the sound perfect from Derek. Okay, so I, I've tried that, thank you. Okay, Derek, I'll see your right. screen is back. Apologies, I think we've got everything back to where, to where it was. So, so nowadays, uh, with, as we've seen now with COVID, a lot of uh, business staff has not been able to drive into the office and physically meet around a table or in a meeting room. And uh, collaboration is also something that the cloud has added. It's made it easy for businesses. They don't, they're not limited to one physical venue. Um, they can have people spread all around the world, working together on projects, uh, building things, designing things, analyzing things. Uh, and, and it's a reason why a business has moved a lot of the functionality into the cloud because it, it enables and unlocks a lot of those collaborative functions. Um, space and location is something that was a big driver in the old days. 
uh, every bank or financial institution, as an example, would have to build a data center. They would have to put a lot of equipment in there. Um, that data center would have to be cooled. It had security, um, all sorts of things. Uh, all of that took time and cost a lot of money before you could even think about starting to deploy your application that you want to make available to your customers. With cloud services nowadays, um, that has become less of an issue. Uh, those things live somewhere else. Somebody else worries about those problems. And you actually, as a business, just become a consumer of the equipment that they have deployed within their own space and locations. Um, once again, very easy to, to add stuff, take away without having to build another room or having a room that's empty because you have stopped a piece of your functionality and you're not rolling that out anymore. Disaster recovery is something that is quite expensive. So we use the banking applications and systems or we look at Netflix or whatever it is and we expect it to always be there. Um, an organization would roll out infrastructure to make that uh, functionality available. But uh, often they would also have a second or a third copy of that running somewhere, just in case the original um, runs into a problem or an error so that they can quickly switch and still make the functionality available to their users. With disaster recovery, that is often nowadays very, very easy. Uh, all of these big cloud providers, if you as a business have deployed some of your systems into those cloud infrastructures, uh, inherently within what they provide, uh, often any data that is stored, systems that are running are spread across at least two to three geographically dispersed locations. So you could have some of your data living locally here in South Africa, Cape Town or Joburg, but you could have a ready-made backup sitting in Amsterdam in case there's a problem with South African infrastructure. Um, and it becomes very easy to switch and to, to keep those uh, environments in sync. Security is something that one can talk a lot about and spend a lot of time on. Um, some people ask and often ask, is the cloud secure? Some people say it's very secure, it's more secure. I think what security, uh, cloud security services has brought, uh, once again, every organization does not need to establish their own infrastructure, their own skill set. Uh, things are, are pre-built, pre-set, and the organizations can start using those. Uh, although inherently, from a technical perspective, most of the stuff that you will be able to access on the cloud nowadays is very, very secure. Um, as I mentioned previously in some of the other talks as well, you as a user uh, can actually mess that up and, uh, and, and give people access that you might not want to give access if you are not careful. So, so the, the access to information, data and systems is still in your hands, but at the lower technical levels, those things are very, very secure. Then uh, all these organizations had to uh, appoint uh, people with huge technical skills uh, in order to service and run the hardware, the underlying software, the operating systems, the networking, all sorts of things. And although typically a business such as the financial institution uh, would still need these technical skills today, um, they can focus on different areas and they can, they can move more of their skill set and people towards providing functionality rather than just supporting all the underlying technical stuff that the end user doesn't even see and in their view doesn't add value other than just having that function available. So, so who is using cloud services today from a business perspective? Um, most of the South African banks that you guys have been used to working um, have moved some of their functionality onto the cloud. Often the core banking application is still running in their own on-premise private infrastructure, but they have added new functions. They are, they are adding analytics, they are adding machine learning, um, they are adding video conferencing with customers. Instead of going into a branch, you can speak to somebody at a call center with voice or often with video. Um, all of those things that they've added around the core offering today uh, in a lot of the banks have been enabled by actually moving things into the cloud. Some organizations that are new and start new startups choose to just deploy everything into the cloud. Um, other, other examples of businesses that have adopted cloud, somebody such as Netflix, uh, most of you guys will probably be using that. Uh, that whole infrastructure runs in the cloud. Uh, DSTV, it runs in the cloud. Um, and one of the reasons why they use that typically is because of the scalability. They can't predict whether they're going to have a million or 4 million or 5 million people at any one point in time using their infrastructure. 
And that back end has to be able to scale, to not waste money, but to actually cope uh, with, the, with the demand and the load. So how do these businesses go about to deploy applications into the cloud? When you look at, it, at deploying applications into the cloud or functionality into the cloud, there are different deployment models that you as a business could use. You could make use of private cloud, you could make use of public cloud, or you could make use of what they call hybrid cloud. Let's have a quick look at what each of those are. So private cloud would be, it would be like owning a car. Um, having your own car and not being dependent on other people or public transport has a lot of, a lot of pros, but it also has some cons. The pros are you've got a very wide choice. You can choose what car you want, how much it costs, how fast it goes, how many people can fit into the car. Um, you can choose whether you drive in the car on your own, so it's very, very private, or you can add two or three passengers. You choose when you start that car up, where you drive it to, how long you stay there, and when you come back. So those are all pros about a private infrastructure. And, and similar from a cloud perspective, when you run that in a private or a private cloud infrastructure, the business organization has got con full control of all of that. The cons of doing it that way, however, though, is when you buy a car, you spend 200 or 300 or a million rand on that car, you might not be using the car all the time. So if you, you might be in that car 10% of the time, but you've still spent all the money, you've paid for the full car, you've spent the whole million rand, but the car is standing in your garage when you're not using it. So you're in a sense, you're actually wasting some money. Um, you have to maintain that car. Um, if you don't drive enough kilometers, you have to start servicing the car based on, on time that has passed. Uh, so there's continuous maintenance costs. Uh, there's a lot of wastage uh, or might be wastage. And as I said, the car might be standing in your garage and you actually don't use it for 100% of the time. So that's what the little fishbone there uh, depicts. If we go to the public option, um, you could compare that to uh, using a bus or using a train, some sort of public transport. What are the pros around public transport? So typically it'll be, it'll be cheaper. There's less wastage. Uh, you just pay for the trips that you actually require. You know, you run down to the bus stop, jump on the bus, go to where you want to be, just pay for that one trip and you get off. And the same with the, and the, same with the train. The cons are you can't really choose what bus you want. You can't choose the size of the bus. You can't choose the color of the bus. You can't choose how fast the bus goes. Once you're on the bus, uh, the bus driver is in control of that. Uh, it's not private. You typically have a lot of people around you on that bus and you cannot choose who shares that bus with you. You also cannot choose when, you can choose when you want to jump onto the bus, but you are limited to the schedule of that bus. So there might be a bus at 10 and a bus at 12 and a bus at three, and in between there are no buses. So you are very, very limited in terms of how, when, and where you use that service. So what has happened is some people have deployed and some businesses have deployed a hybrid version of this. In a, in a hybrid version, it's probably a bit like, like using a taxi or using Uber, but also having, still having your own car, but the car can be much smaller. It's maybe a little two door city commuter car. When you need to take more people with you, you phone the Uber, they come with a nice big vehicle and you five people can jump in there and go where you need to go. So, so the choices are a little more than just using public transport. You can choose whether you are on your own or not. Not really because you always have the driver in there. Um, so there's a degree of privacy. Um, it's not as private as your personal private car, but it's also not, not uh, as exposed as, as public transport. From a, from a scheduling perspective, you choose when you want to phone the taxi or when you want to phone Uber to come and pick you up. So it's flexible according to your schedule, but still, if you need to go somewhere within the next minute and you phone that Uber and he comes around, he might be there only in 10 minutes or 20 minutes time. So, so scheduling, you're in a lot more control around that, but not as you would have been if you had your own private car. Um, you don't need to maintain that car, somebody else maintains the car, they buy the car, and you get the choice to choose whether you want a small, medium, or large. And from a cloud infrastructure perspective, from a business perspective, it provides them with the same thing. So those are the deployment models. People typically deploy stuff in a private cloud, a public cloud, or a hybrid cloud, where some of it uses my old private infrastructure, and some of it is in the cloud. And, and 
the spread between the two can vary greatly. Some people have a lot of stuff in the cloud and just their crown jewels and their private infrastructure. Uh, other people have everything in the cloud. People have everything in the cloud or some have none. But you can choose what you want and what mix you want of that. What are the service models that you can use when you deploy stuff in the cloud? So there's the traditional way of how people did things. And then in a cloud world, there are, there are different service models that a business can utilize. Um, we've got some more acronyms there. Previously, we had a lot of TLAs, which were three letter acronyms. Now we're using a couple of FLAs, which are four letter acronyms. Um, the first one there, or the second from the left is IAAS, and that is just an acronym for infrastructure as a service. Next, we have platform as a service. And on the right, we have software as a service. And those are different service models that when you just, once you've decided whether you want to use private, public, or hybrid cloud, then you can choose wh which of these service models you actually want to utilize. So let's have a quick look at the traditional way of doing something. So a business would own everything, deploy it all into its own data center, be in control of it all, of it all be responsible for all of the costs, all of the maintenance, and the availability. So typically, a, let's use a bank again. The bank would roll out the banking application uh, on their own infrastructure. That banking application would be running on some sort of system software underneath that that makes it work. There'd be an operating system, such as you have Windows or uh, iOS or Mac OS or Android on your own personal devices. And there would be some hardware underneath that that operating system would run all, on all of that in that organization's own data center, all under control of their own staff. If they choose to use the infrastructure as a service cloud model, they would still be in control of the application. They would still deploy their own software. They would still choose which operating system they want to run, but they would not buy the hardware. They would get that off somebody that provides that functionality in the cloud. So it'd be, it would be a soft configured environment. Um, and you wouldn't worry about the hardware. You wouldn't worry about the patching of the hardware. You wouldn't worry about firmware upgrades. None of that. The cloud service provider would be watching, uh, worrying about that. And you would only pay for the bits and pieces that you use. If you choose to go the platform as a service route, you would still deploy your application. Um, but the system software would now be acquired from the cloud provider. Uh, the operating system and the hardware. So you can see you don't worry about any of the technical bits below. You only worry about your application and what functionality that provides to your customer. Then you could go all out where you could say everything, all of these layers are provided by the uh, service provider. An example of that would be a business that typically uses a general ledger. In the past, they would buy a general ledger software that would deploy it on some hardware with operating systems and other software on there. Um, but it doesn't really provide that business with a, a technical benefit or an economic benefit, as opposed to the business next door. Both of them have to use a general ledger in order to do their books. Um, it's not a technical technical advantage for that business. So in, in the end, they could both just buy a general ledger service from somebody in the cloud. They could both use it, have their own financials in there, but rather have their people spend the time to focus on their own applications and the thing that differentiates them from the guy next door. So those are the service models. Uh, let's make it a little bit more practical. Um, so, so let's say you are organizing a birthday party. Your, your, your end goal is to, to have a birthday party for your friend next door. The old traditional way would be just to do it everything yourself. Okay, so you'd set the table, you would have to decorate the cake that goes on the table, you would bake the cake, and originally you would go and buy all the ingredients that you had to use to bake that cake. If we move to a ready mix environment, which you can compare to infrastructure as a service, you would still do the presentation bit, set the table, you would still decorate the cake, you would still bake the cake, but you could go out and just buy a ready mix box with all of the ingredients in there. So you don't worry what it is, you know you like the inner parman chocolate cake and you take it home, you mix it, decorate it and present it. If, if you go the platform as a service route in terms of your party, you would still set up the presentation, but the decoration and the baking and the ingredients might be taken care of by somebody else. So you could order a delivery service and uh, the Mr. Delivery Vehicle stops at your front door, gives you the completely baked cake, you take it inside, put it on the table that you want and decorate it as you want. 
Um, then there's the last option, which compares with software service. The presentation, decoration, baking, and ingredients are all outsourced. Um, you just take your friends and you take them to a restaurant, you sit down, and it's all done. The plates are there, the cutlery is there, the food is there, somebody takes it away, somebody cleans it. And that is, that is just a little bit of a, an example of, of, in a practical world, looking at baking a cake and presenting it to somebody, how you could map that onto these different sorts of services that one could consume in the, in the, uh, in the cloud. And remember, we're still talking about mostly how people would consume it from a business perspective. So all of us as individuals, why would we use the cloud? So I think there are three things that I could just quickly think of that I listed there. Um, for, for us as an individual, convenience, continuity, and cost for me are reasons why you would use the cloud. Um, in this case here, yeah, we are all seeing each other, listening to each other. We can... Um, communicate with each other, it's very convenient. We don't have to climb in a car, drive somewhere and go and sit on a chair in a hall to attend a session such as this. Uh, the cloud services in the back that we are using underneath a product such as Zoom makes it very convenient for us to actually have a similar experience without uh, the actual time and cost and risk associated with traveling. Uh, continuity, cloud services for you as an individual, there are many things that provide you with automatic backup you can share things, you can have different copies of things living off your own private infrastructure or your own PC, so that if your hard drive goes or your PC packs up, that your data is not gone. And then lastly, from a cost perspective, in the old days, you had to buy expensive software, you had to deploy it on your PC. Uh, if you wanted something similar on your phone, you would have to buy another package and put it on your phone. Uh, if you had a tablet, you would once again spend money and put it on the tablet. With a lot of these cloud-based services that we as individuals could use nowadays, uh, once you have paid for that service, you are often able to utilize that across many platforms and devices. Why would we use the cloud as individuals? Uh, I just explained something such as Zoom, which is the collaboration we've done now. It makes it easy. You can speak to your grandchildren, your friends, your family um, from the comfort and the safety of your house. Um, Cloud sounds like something new, but a lot of us have actually been using cloud for, for a long time. If you, if you look at search functionality on the internet uh, using uh, Bing or Google search, those cloud search services um, is some of the first examples of things running in the cloud where we as a user would just open up a browser and access it. We don't care where it runs, how big it is, how many people are using it. It's somebody else's problem in the background. Email is also an example of something that has been around for a long time, something such as Gmail. It runs in the cloud within the Google infrastructure, and all you have is a browser or a client app, and you can actually utilize that email. You don't worry about how the systems work behind it. Backups, I think, is fairly useful from, a, from an individual perspective. Uh, today, you can take a lot of photographs with your phone, and if you are worried about losing the phone or the phone breaking, you can set up processes where the photographs that you take will automatically back up to the cloud. And if the phone gets lost, your photographs and memories aren't lost. A quick demo of well, one, what one of these cloud applications look like. So in this case, I've looked at Microsoft OneDrive. Um, it's their cloud storage offering for individuals and, and organizations. Um, but we're looking at the individual side now. So there you'll see an, an, an example of what the Microsoft OneDrive application looks like if you open it up on your mobile device. So they have a home page where you can see um, the recent files that you've worked on. You can see which files are offline. Uh, typically, applications such as this has got the ability, they will access the data interactively off the cloud, but also you can mark stuff for offline storage so that even if you don't have data connectivity or cell phone reception, that you can actually still get to that data. That is just what one of the file screens will look like. So if you look at the little options at the bottom here, I've, I'm just working through these so that you can just get a quick view. So on your, on your computer today, you would have a list of folders and files within those folders. You could move that onto a cloud service and you could get you that from your home computer or you could get you the exact same information by opening up an app on your mobile device and selecting any of those folders and you would see the files inside. And the cloud service would keep all of these in sync with your home computer back home. So automatically 
while driving and visiting somebody and you remember that you forgot to bring a document along, you can open up this, click on the folder, go to the document, open it up and share it with your friend wherever you are. Um, this is just an example of once you open up all of those folders or one of those folders, you would see that most of these cloud applications and cloud storage services um, have preview functionality in them. So even though you don't have a PDF reader or a Word uh, application or a PowerPoint or an Excel application on that device, these cloud services would be able to open that document and provide you with a preview, a very basic preview of what the content is in that file. If you then decide you want to use some of the more advanced functions of let's say Excel, you can click on the file, open it up and pull it into Excel and, and work with it. You could share anything within any of those folders with any of your friends. So in this case here, yeah, if I look at my phone, I can see I've got stuff that is shared by me and I can see who I've shared that with. Um, you could open that up and you could see exactly what the folders are and each and every one of those folders or files that you've shared with somebody, you can uh, effect different actions on that. So I can share it, I can delete it. The moment I delete it, the other person won't be able to see it. I can just unshare it, but not delete it. Um, all of those functions are available in those apps. Uh, that is just an example of a photo gallery. Um, you could set up your phone to automatically transfer all of your photographs to your cloud service. And then from your, from your desktop or your mobile device, you could access any of those photographs share it, you could click on something, choose to share it and send it to a friend with whatever medium you want. It could be WhatsApp, it could be via the cloud service, or you could just send a link to one of those files to one of your friends and they would be able to click on that link and open the file which actually lives in your cloud service and not on their, on their infrastructure. So there are many of these personal cloud storage options. Um, I've just listed a couple here. So the first, the first row there is Microsoft. Uh, they have a OneDrive uh, offering that they provide. Google has a similar offering. There's Dropbox, there's Apple with their iCloud service, and then Amazon has also got a similar service. Uh, all of these services, uh, you're allowed to try them out for free. So if you're not using any of these, you can go and download the app or go to a web page where you can read about those. Um, and they are set up fairly similarly, but there are small differences between some of these. If we look at the first, the second column there, uh, capacity free. For the free service, if you use the Microsoft OneDrive service, you as an individual can store up to five gigs of data in the cloud. Um, thereafter, they would stop you and you would have to pay in order to do more. If you choose the paid option, you as an individual can then store up to one terabyte in the cloud. And that's quite a lot. A lot of people have hard drives in their home computers, which are of that size or smaller. So um, uh, Google, once again, slightly differently, 15 gigs, they have a little more, uh, Dropbox two gigs, and you can look at the sizes there. So there's a free option. The important thing is there's a free option and there's a paid option. All of those different options, doesn't matter which one you choose, they all op offer functionality such as storing the files offline, synchronizing files between devices, uh, most of those guys within those apps have got a button that you can push to say scan. You could scan an invoice or a photograph or a document. It will automatically scan that, format it, and upload it to your cloud storage device. So even though you scanned an invoice with your phone while out on the road, when you get back home, you can access that very same invoice from your cloud storage area. Um, preview I just showed you in the app on the previous screen. Uh, all of these services have some form of search functionality and typically it would be pre-indexed and, and very quick. You can also search your home computer hard drive for a specific file name or a piece of text, but it will take quite long to run through that. Um, so these services provide you with a very optimized search functionality. You could share any of that information with any people out there. The security portion of that would allow you to put a password on that share so that the other person that gets the link sharing that information um, needs to also add, enter a password before they can open the link. So I can send you a link through the cloud service, but I can WhatsApp you the password so that if somebody opens the mail with a link, they don't have the password, so they can't access your data. You need both of those. So there's different security options. You can set expiration on these links so I can share something with you for a day or for a week, and then it will automatically expire, and I don't have to remember to take away that access. Um, the people that you organized, that you shared it with will automatically then not be able to get to that. Some of these have also got the functionality to backup this column here. You can backup stuff and you can download software onto your PC. 
where you can automatically back up selected areas of your hard drive to your cloud drive. You can set that up to do it once a day or exclude specific things. Um, most of these services will allow you to then actually restore any of those files to any point in time for the last 30 days. So even you might have changed or deleted the file on your actual PC, you can still go to the cloud service and, and recover it from there. Some of them have got uh, offerings such as this one called Account Rewind, Rewind, where you're not just restoring a specific device, but you can actually restore all of the files and all of the folders on your PC uh, as to what it looked like one week ago or two days ago, if you have a, a really catastrophic event happening on there. Um, nowadays, you people would have heard a lot of people talk about ransomware, and that is where people trick you into downloading a piece of software that they install on your computer, and uh, they then encrypt all of your hard drive with a key that you don't know what it is. And uh, once that has happened, you can't access any of the data on there. A lot of these cloud services provide protection against ransomware. If your hard drive on your computer were to become encrypted by some ransomware software that somehow found its way onto that device, you can go into your cloud service from another computer with a browser and you could choose what you want to get back. Um, you could set up your PC from freshly, uh, put a new operating system on there with no data on there and then go to your cloud service, sign in and actually get all of that files back. So it provides you with some level of protection around that as well. As well. Um, some of these options have got uh, a vault and that's just another level of privacy. So you've got your cloud storage area where you decide who gets access and who doesn't, but they have a vault where you could put personal information, identity related stuff, such as your passport, your ID, um, anything that you have that you store in a folder that you don't want people to get to by accident. So it's another level of protection it's password protected. You can choose how long that password is. Um, and even Microsoft or Google's own personnel won't be able to get to the, uh, to the content stored within that vault because it's, it's encrypted with your personal key. Um, some of these options uh, offer you uh, extended uh, functionality. If you look at the Microsoft side of things with Microsoft, you can also uh, subscribe to their Microsoft 365 service on top of just using their, their Microsoft OneDrive. That will typically give you access to all of the Microsoft Office software, that being Word, PowerPoint, Excel, um, Outlook, uh, OneDrive, uh, OneNote, and nowadays Teams. Um, you pay a monthly subscription or you can pay it annually. If you subscribe to Microsoft 365, um, your five gigs that you saw on the left there as free capacity would automatically jump up to one terabyte. You have access to all of the Microsoft Office software. You can download it onto, it used to be five devices. Nowadays, I think it's up to 10 devices. So you can put it on your home PC, you could put it on your mobile phone and you could put it on your tablet. Um, and you can download the software and actually install it on the device. Um, Google has a similar option where you could uh, use spreadsheet functionality or word processing functionality uh, via a browser on any of these files that live within this cloud environment. But you could also subscribe to their Google One service, which just gives you a little bit of more space and some added functionality on top of that. Um, that's just a quick rundown of, of what these cloud storage services provide individuals. And um, I will have a look and I can maybe share a couple of links so that you can go to either Microsoft or Google or Dropbox and go and read up on this if you are interested on what the costs are and what the different tiers are if you want to access some of it. I think that sums up most of what I wanted to say. Um, and it's time for questions. Well, thank you, Derek. I think that was very comprehensive, um, a lot of things. and. Yeah, any questions? You can either raise your hand or type it in the chat panel. Bernard, I see you. Just unmute yourself. Yes, Bernard. I've, often as a backup to my own, PC, uh, my, my own PC, I've got an external hard drive. Um, would you say that it's no longer necessary to use external hard drives to uh, back up your 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 data on your computer and rather use this um, cloud system is that going to be much easier to do in the future 
Yes, so so the free tier that I mentioned is 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 limited to five five gigs or fifteen gigs or so. A hard drive that you attach to your computer would typically be you know five hundred gigs or one terabyte in size. So in order to get to uh, to a competitive sizing, you would obviously have to subscribe to one of the paid options. So it would it would cost a couple of rand a month. Uh, if you if you choose to pay annually with most of these services, they give you a discount, and you typically you would pay the equivalent of about 10 months and then get 12 months worth of, of usage. Um, hard drives still has, still has a function and, and it depends, you know, from the individual, uh, what they want to do with the information that they've put on that drive. If you only have a hard drive for backup purposes, the cloud services could take over that functionality. Remember I mentioned ransomware earlier on for you to access that external hard drive. It is connected to your computer. If ransomware were to end up on your computer, it would encrypt all of the storage on that on that computer. So your primary hard drive would be encrypted, but your external USB-based drive that you store your backups on would also be encrypted by that ransomware, and you wouldn't be able to get to that. And that, that is where the cloud backup functionality is differentiated slightly. So um, they are aware of things such as ransomware, and they keep versions of software offline which you as a user are able to get to or files. Um, so, so yes, you could get rid, you could get rid of that external hard drive as long as you have enough capacity in your, in your cloud storage offering that you are utilizing. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, Michael, Michael Fleming, just unmute. Yes, one question. How how is this cloud, uh, the, um, uh, can it crash? And uh, is it finite or infinite? Yes, so, so um, the people that sell these cloud services uh, would like to say that it's infinite. Uh, I don't think it is. It is. It is still limited to what the sizes of the infrastructure that they have behind all of this. But, but they tend to roll these out preemptively and at at scale, at, at very, very large scale. So for us as a user, um, whatever you as an individual might want to use from a storage capacity perspective, as long as you are able to pay the monthly subscription associated to the level of usage that you want, um, there wouldn't really be anything finite for you as a private user. Even for organizations, I think um, a lot of these cloud providers, uh, sometimes people want to use cloud, but they want to use it in a very protected environment. Um, such as uh, if you look in the, in the USA, uh, the CIA or the FBI, those guys nowadays are, are big users of cloud services, but they don't want to use public cloud. They obviously want to use private cloud, but they don't want to maintain it themselves. So uh, a Google or a Microsoft, whoever is contracted with them, will often roll out dedicated infrastructure and will make sure that there's enough of that to, uh, to actually provide for the capacity that is required. Uh, often you. people would also get a huge discount. If you look at corporate users, they get a huge discount for, for pre-committing to usage. So if at the beginning of the year, I commit to a minimum level of usage, you can sort of think about it as, as prepaid airtime. Um, uh, the more you buy, the, the cheaper it gets per minute. Um, but if you don't use it at the end of the year or the end of the month, the unused bits lapse. So these guys have got similar models, uh, models with corporates where if the corporate is able to commit to a minimum usage, they would give them a reduced price, but it would also allow them to plan and size for what they think or know that corporate might use. So there's different mechanisms that people use to make sure that the capacity of what is rolled out is, uh, is sufficient. From an availability perspective, um, about a week or so ago, you would have seen if you read the internet and some of the articles, uh, Microsoft Outlook was down for a while. Uh, WhatsApp was down for a while. If you're a user of any of these services, you would know that from time to time, for short periods, they might not be available. And it might be because of local outages in specific countries. It might be because a huge communication cable that runs between Europe and Africa has been damaged. And uh, the backup route, for some reason, is also not up. Then there might be an outage. But typically, these uh, infrastructures are very, very, very redundant, much more redundant than any organized private organization or individual would have within their own premises. Um, data, I did mention it quickly earlier on, but if you store a file in one of these cloud services, Microsoft themselves typically or Google would make sure that that specific file 
is stored in at least three data centers at the same time. So even if they lose a complete data center, they would still be able to access that file in two other data centers, which are typically in a different ge geographical location as well. So the South African data center might be down, but you can still get to your data through their services from the UK or the Amsterdam data center. Could I ask you what sort of supplementary, you, you mentioned ransomware. Could we perhaps, Johan, have this as a separate subject sometime? It's worrying me no end now. Okay, thanks, yes. um, Michael. I think if you complete the survey later today, there's room there for a comment for a future topic. So please just put it in there, then okay. I will remember it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll have to wrap it up there with the questions. I'll just see, you can also watch the chat panel and there's a comment there from Jeff, which I think is very valid. Remember, although it's a cost saving in a way to use the cloud services, you still have to have connectivity. So in a way, you will use more bandwidth to upload and download your um, storage to the cloud. Just something to consider. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, now the next topic is about cookies and uh, digital tracks and data privacy. Now, Peter Geldenhuis, I send his profile um, out with newsletter 5, so I will not repeat it here in total. But just to give you some background, I often listen to RSG, the Afrikaans radio station, and that is where I got to know Peter. He's a regular speaker about technology and future developments on RSG. Uh, he was always introduced on the radio as a professor or lecturer of the Northwest University. So I assumed that he lived somewhere in the Northwest province, in a town like Potchefstroom. But when we met in real life a few weeks ago, down here at Waterstone, at the Mug and Bean, Peter told me he lives here in Somerset West, about a stone throw from where I live. So that was a nice surprise. And lately I hear on Monday, I listened again. Usually it's on Mondays afternoons on RSG. He spoke about HAPS. Now, Peter, I won't steal your thunder with that, but maybe that's a future topic. But yes, it was a nice surprise to hear that he's a local. And I'm looking forward to the presentation. Peter, over to you. Thank you. It's a wonderful invitation that you want extended. It's uh, my, my privilege and my honor to be in front of you this morning. And although the topic that you want chose isn't really in my, in my normal repertoire, um, it, it links up with a variety of other elements that is linked to the topic. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. You want, I just want to double check and you, all of you see my screen in front of you and hopefully you'll be able to follow the, the presentation. You want, are we ready to go? Yes, thank you, Peter. I can hear you good, and I can also see your screen. Thanks. Thank you very much. So um, when everyone says you need to delete your cookies, I think the cookie monster is by far the most worried when you want to say delete your cookies. And specifically, if tech support calls and say, please remove all your cookies, uh, you might get a whole bunch of different responses. But the question is, what the hell is cookies? And why is cookies called cookies? So cookies started out in about 1995 when the Netscape browser community wanted to, to keep track of users. And uh, they, they talked about magic cookies at that point in time. A magic cookie was a, a part of the folklore in uh, tracking and, and having a special uh, mythical powers. And that's where cookies came from, where you could track someone's behavior or their identity. And then when they log into your website again, you would, could, could then utilize that knowledge in order to personalize the website for that person that would then uh, access the website again. And that was the origin of cookies. Literally, the cookie is a small text file that is stored on your device or your computer. And you normally, uh, in later years, have to give uh, permission for a cookie to be stored on your device. And fundamentally, it's a tracking, it, it's a bit of, of script that the server on the other side would then utilize to identify what you've done previously and then uh, perform certain key uh, features on their server on the back end to show you a different front end. 
Amazon would, for example, do so by showing you some of the items that you'd be you do find more interesting than normal. So that would literally would, what the cookie would look like. So what is the physical structure of a cookie? The go-to website, for example, will put a cookie on your device. It'll have a user ID and a website, that's it. But uh, Amazon ID might be far more advanced. It could have a time-lapse code, a, a code that would expire, or a code that would give more details about who you are as an individual. The most important thing is that the tracking happens on the company server. The cookies is simply just a bit of text that is made available on your device. And it's very interesting that after some privacy legislation came up, uh, it meant that companies couldn't share private information anymore. And therefore, a lot more companies had to implement their own tracking behavior. That's why you get such a huge amount of cookies that is now available on websites. Um, and this is really the interesting part of a cookie is that it's purely just an identifier that is put on your device, but the tracking and the, the magic that happens behind the scenes actually happens on the server side of the equation. So uh, if you want to remove cookies, it's not that difficult. You go to Google, you say, how do you remove cookies? And that's the process that you can simply follow and you can do it on a variety of different browsers. So the real impact of cookies and, and the reason why it plays such an important role is the whole marketing ecosystem behind the scenes. And a number of years ago, legislation came forward that you couldn't really track individual information. And yes, what happened? The search engines and all the other entities that made money out of advertising came up with an interesting trick. Instead of storing your personal details, they stored your advertiser number. If you open up your phone, and if you go to the ads button on Google, you'll find an advertiser number. And that advertiser number is linked to your profile, your age, what you're interested in, your interest, your, they, they can build an entire personality profile around your searches on the internet. And I'll show you in a moment how that is done. So this advertiser number in a large way replaced your name. And this advertiser number is then going up for auction. So if you know that you fit into the specific profile, you're in this age group, you live in this area, you're interested in these uh, attributes or these products, if you adhere to the following personality or lifestyle, then your profile is up for auction. And a variety of advertisers will, will then bid on getting the ability to advertise to you. So that, that's how it normally works. So you can, for example, um, send an email to someone, hey, I'm interested in decking. Do you know of anyone that can do so? And then magically, decking advertisements will appear on all the websites that you visit. Well, that's how it works. You know, if you get anything for free on the internet, you are the product. So if you utilize a free Gmail account, Google will then look at certain keywords in your Gmail. And if you are interested in decking, hey, guess what? Whatever website you will visit, that syndicated advertising mechanism will then start punting decking products to you. Uh, the same would happen on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. So the moment you send personal messages to someone, they'll look at what is inside your messages and then utilize that to drive advertising behavior. So uh, in, in a way, there's a couple of very interesting shortcuts that the community have utilized in order to, to bypass certain legislation around personal tracking. Uh, so they stop tracking your uh, name, and they start tracking your advertiser number. So what does that mean and how does it play out? So for those of you that might be interested in learning more about what other companies know about you, there's a variety of options to consider. You can go onto the Facebook profile or the Google profile page. A little bit later, I'll open up my browser page, John, and then I'll show you what you can do in order to track your own um, or to find out what they know about you. So that's a brief overview of what Google knows about me. So there's a whole list of things. They know um, what my age category is. They know what websites I normally go to. Uh, there's a couple of Chinese websites that I normally visit to buy some Internet of Things devices. You can see them, uh, Banggood and Superbalist and YouTube. These are the websites I normally focus on. In the last couple of days, I uh, bought a new vehicle and I, and I looked at a couple of advertising or uh, insurance options. And hey, guess what? Uh, they've actually tracked all of my behavior online. So the, the last 30 or 40 websites you visit, um, they keep track of in, in, in their short-term search engines, but every single thing you've done over the last five years is automatically tracked as well. 
and um, your interest is then utilized to create a profile. And I'm going to explain how this profile is created and uh, what is the benefit that organizations can obtain from it. So that's a brief overview of the world of mobile devices and websites. But what are the other devices being utilized to uh, enrich your life, but also to obtain additional information from you is the so-called next big thing. And, and the next big thing is not, as you would have guessed, a gadget. It would be invisible and it would be all around us. Because the question is, what is the next big thing after our mobile phones? And first we had the internet and then tablets and mobile phones for the last 12 years, specifically the smartphones, were the previous big thing. Well, all of us right now know what the next big thing will be. And you guessed it, the next big thing is the UPA or the ubiquitous personal assistant. Most of you know it as Alexa. For those of you that don't know it, here's a brief introductory video. Introducing Echo Plus. It's everything you love about Echo, now with a built-in smart home hub. Echo Plus connects to Alexa to play music, make calls, control smart home devices, and more. And because Alexa is in the cloud, she's always getting smarter and adding new features. Echo Plus has room-filling speakers powered by Dolby and seven microphones that can hear you from any direction, even when music is playing. And now with its built-in smart home hub, Echo Plus lets you quickly set up and control your smart home. No need for a separate hub or app. Just say, Alexa, discover my devices. Starting discovery. And Echo Plus will instantly find and set up your compatible smart lights, locks, plugs, and more. I've discovered three devices. And just like that, you can use your voice to control your smart home devices. Alexa, turn off the living room light. OK. Whoa! With Echo Plus, you can ask Alexa to do simple things. Alexa, has Fitbit how many steps I've taken? You have taken about 13,006 steps. <sighs> Alexa, turn on the fan. OK. Or you can ask her to do multiple things all at once. Alexa, start the weekend. OK, here's your flash briefing. In weather, right now, it's 70 degrees with partly sunny skies. Today, and of course, Echo Plus helps you in all the same ways Echo can. Alexa, play my date night playlist. Your playlist day at night. The Thompsons canceled the sleepover. Alexa, what family movies are playing nearby? Family movies playing near you today. Alexa, what's on my calendar for tomorrow? Tomorrow there is one event. There's Teresa's birthday party at 2 p.m. Is that true? Is it your birthday? Yes, it is. This is the sweetest girl in the world. Oh, it's you. Alexa, drop in on Dylan's bedroom. Come on, time to get up. Mm -hmm. Just 10 more minutes. Alexa, play my wake up playlist in Dylan's bedroom. Your playlist, wake up. Alexa, let's go camping. Okay. Good night. Good night. The all new Amazon Echo Plus with built in smart home hub. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the next big thing. It's built into our phones. I've got a couple of earbuds. I just tap it and I say, hey, Alexa, get me this information. And it gets it. There's also the Google Assistant on phones, as well as some of the Siri uh, assistants. They're not as bright or as clever, but yeah, well, they're, they're trying their best. But let me show you how simple it is. On your normal device, you press your little on button for more than a second, and you ask it a question. Hey, Google, what's the weather in Cape Town today? Today in Cape Town, it'll be cloudy with a forecast high of 19 and a low of 13. And you can literally ask it anything. Hey, Google, how do you spell guacamole? Guacamole is spelled G-U-A-C-A-M-O-L-E. And this is normally how I listen to my news. I just simply ask Google to play the latest news headlines. Hey, Google, play the latest news headlines. Here's the latest news. From headlines from BBC News at 11.01 a.m. today. So there you go. You never have to wait until uh, the top of the hour to listen to news. You can listen to it anytime you want. So linear radio is dead. It's now personalized radio. The whole idea is that through these personal assistants, and literally you have it anywhere, all, all around you, in your house, in your car, 
There's more than 100 million of them being sold. So it's not actually the next big thing. It's currently the current big thing. And a lot more people are adopting the technology. However, that's one of the technologies that is extracting a tremendous amount of information from you as the user. And that's the kind of new generation cookie that we're picking up. So voice is becoming the primary interface into the internet, and that will define the internet in years ahead. And that's also a primary key indicator of how where the world is heading. If we take a look at some of the services that Alexa has been using for the last couple of years, and what I'm showing you is not new, it's literally four or five years old. Abroad, you can ask Alexa to get to call your Uber taxi. And the moment the Uber arrives, it says, hey, your Uber's outside. Or you can say, hey, order a pizza. And the, and the pizza's delivered and the money automatically deducted from your credit card. You can even ask it to activate a medical emergency, at which point in time an ambulance will be notified, your front door will be unlocked, or the telephone number that will open your gate would then be activated for that period of time. So huge amount of capability. Personal emergencies, I can simply just go to Google and say, hey, Google, emergency, and emergency would be created. Really, that's emergency okay. created. All right. So uh, a variety of key features are available to do this. The Internet of Things then can, can link into this ecosystem. And that's one of the other key elements that will obtain information from you. More about that a bit later. But the IoT domain is one of the key growth areas where we automate everything in our homes and everything uh, we can think of can literally be automated. In my little studio I have here, I've got the entire thing automated. It's got about 40 Internet addresses in it. It's actually a bit of a, a, an old fashioned uh, research focus for anything that's more than three years old in the IoT space. But your IoT ecosystem is changing the, how we perceive the world around us. And more about that perhaps in a later session. But what we've seen is that your IoT devices also can obtain information about your ecosystem and also creates a security risk. So um, some of the technologies and the reason I put this one up is that the intelligence that we had in our phones are now being converted into intelligence into cameras. Cameras can now detect human movement. So the whole idea of having a camera is out outdated. The software defined cameras actually become a human movement detection system. And that has got some benefits and disadvantages. But this IoT ecosystem is literally the new found frontier in terms of how we can utilize it to enrich our world, but also how we how companies can obtain information about individuals. And let me explain that um, in the following way. So um, Google, for example, is interested in the wearable watch ecosystem. A little bit later, I'll show you how they do personality profiling based on your online behavior. But as you watch a YouTube video or as you watch a movie, they can also detect your heart rate on your device. And you could, could, could get angry if you're confronted with something you don't like. So guess what? They can even get a deeper insight into your personality by looking at how you respond physiologically to certain information. And by therefore looking at your heart rate monitor, they can have a very clear idea of how you respond in certain circumstances. So your tracking of individuals goes one step further. And that goes beyond just the phone and the website, but also into the wearables that you wear on a daily basis. One of the companies that have highlighted the impact of wearables and, and tracking and tracing is Discovery, specifically the Discovery car insurance industry. You see, they moved away from a model of just doing a risk profiling based on who you are and how old you are and where you stay, which is a really old fashioned way of looking at it. And some people say, but if you can track people's behavior and how they drive, maybe that's a way in which you can create a risk profile. Discovery went one step further. And they are saying, show me how you will change your driving behavior and you're changing your driving behavior will unlock the benefits uh, that you would get from the discovery ecosystem. And this is behavior-based modification, which is literally the holy grail in risk analysis. So, and, and this is all part and parcel of this world of tracking and tracing, in a way, the new generation of cookies that we have on our devices, on our intelligent speakers, on our mobile phones, and on our websites. The question is, what do we do with that information? And let me show you briefly what is the key to unlocking all of this? It's all about machine learning and artificial intelligence. The, the mathematics behind machine learning and artificial intelligence is literally 30 years old. When I studied my engineering degree 30 years ago, this was the same mathematics we used then. 
The thing is, we never had the data. So you could never get the data in order to truly run these engines. And now in a hyper-connected world with cookies and everything else that is gathering information, we have a smorgasbord of data sources available. In the United States, there's four and a half data points per individual available. And knowing that information, we can then run AI mechanisms or AI engines in order to identify the behavior patterns or predict the behavior patterns of individuals. Let me quickly explain the difference between statistical analysis and machine learning in, a, in layman's terms. Statistical analysis is where we already have pre-categorized data sets. So we create the categories and then we go out and say, let's take a look how the data fits in with our predefined categories. With machine learning, we say there are no categories. There's no hypothesis. Let's go out and see which data sets cluster together. And out of those clusters, we create our own categorizations. In an environment where your cause and effect relationship is predictable and repeatable, your so-called ordered world events, we can use machine learning to identify behavioral patterns that are predictable. For example, when a machine will fail or when a component will fail. So once we've analyzed the data, we can create an algorithm that you can put on a device which will have all the intelligence. This is literally what I've showed you now. In the past, our voice was recognized by artificial intelligence, not anymore. We know, we've got so many data sets available that all of that knowledge have been converted into an algorithm and the algorithm is made available on your device. So now I don't need to be connected to the internet for my device to understand me because my voice recognition is now an algorithm that sits on my device. It's no longer needed by the cloud, all right? However, one of the environments which is not predictable is human systems. So human systems, which differ over time, we've seen that the accuracy of our models only works for about a six month period. When we use the same models to try and predict behavior patterns over a two year period, we see completely really disappointing results. So the behavior patterns means that these categorizations that we've identified with an ARN keeps on changing. So the entire categorizations that optimizes our behavior to influence the market changes over time as well. So in human systems, which is complex adaptive systems, where the cause and effect relationship is not repeatable and only visible in retrospect, in those domains, AI will continue living a rich and healthy life. So we, for example, see AI kind of dying out in the machine conditioning space, because once you have an algorithm, you've got the algorithm. But in human systems, the so-called computational social science field, we've got unbelievable amount of work that still lies ahead of us. So let's quickly talk about AI and some of the key interesting mechanisms being utilized to unlock data. So the question normally was, can AI be creative? Can it conduct a symphony? Can it create something? And the answer is yes, it can. And it learns from humans in doing so. so let's for example, say you want to create a trailer for a movie. Let's say, um, now normally it takes about four individuals and about 30 days to create a 60 second trailer to capture the essence of a movie that would in attract people to go and watch it. But how will AI do so? Oh, well, it's really quite simple. You take a thousand movies or 10,000 movies and 10,000 trailers created by humans. Then you tell the AI engine, listen, go and take a look at the following 10,000 movies and its associated trailers and look at some underlying hidden patterns that we as humans don't even recognize or see. It could be where in the movie or, or, or different sounds or emotions or you, whatever. Go and take a look at these linkages. And then out of these linkages, if we feed you a movie, you as an AI engine can now create a trailer from the movie based on your learned experience from the other trailers that were created by humans. So in 2016, the very first trailer was created by an AI entity. I'm going to show it to you. The movie was called Morgan. And believe it or not, this trailer was created in one day using one individual instead of a 30 day four individual exercise. Here's a trailer by uh, Watson. And this was from the movie Morgan. It's first birthday. You like it? It exceeds our, our wildest expectations. Nice to meet you, Morgan. Nice to meet you, Lee.
I have a 13 year old daughter. You don't get to see her much anymore. What? Don't you go down there, Skip! Don't be afraid. Be me. I have to go say goodbye to Mother. And there you go. Are you scared yet? So AI is one of the tools that is utilized in order to get deeper insight into individuals, literally unlocking all of the behavior patterns. And before 2018, it was quite easy to obtain the access to the so-called graphs. The social, and, um, the social and open graph by Facebook, the economic graph of um, LinkedIn, and the knowledge graph of Google. So these are the graphs that enabled you to have a back-end access into different individuals and what their interests were. You feed all of that data through artificial intelligence engine, and then you have different graphs coming out of it to get deeper insight into individuals. I'll explain that in a lot more detail. But these graphs were literally open. In South Africa, you had some struggles getting access to the full graph. In the US, you could get full access to the graphs of individuals. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg was very really happy about this fact and even boasted about it before the Cambridge Analytica scandal. More about that in a moment. What I'm going to do, you on is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I'm going to log on to a browser. So I'm going to open up the, the Firefox browser and I'm going to take access of that in a moment. And I'm going to show you, and I, I, I only use Firefox for this purpose uh, to do an over or to give you a brief overview of how people are tracking you. So you, we, the whole talk is about cookies and what cookies can do. So let me show you what can cookies literally do when it's available on your device. So let me show you what that means. Um, Juan, can you all see my Firefox browser at this point in time? Yes, we can see that. All right. So for those of you interested, download the Firefox browser for this purpose. Then there's a little button, the mini waffle on the right-hand side. You click on it. You go to the add-on button over here. And then there's an add-on by, by the name of Lightbeam, sim similar to... Um, the light beam of a, of a torch, shedding light on stuff. And you can then just add the light beam. Once you've done that, it installs a little logo on your top menu bar. And I'm going to show you in a moment what that all transpires or means. So without further ado, I'm going to go to CNN. Let's log on to CNN, BBC, uh, News24, uh, and uh, The Economist. Right. OK, I've logged on to four websites. I've done that in the last 20 seconds. How many entities are tracking me right now? Oh, and I've got cookies, seeing that I'm not using this often, seeing that we talk about cookies. How many companies do you think is tracking me right now? Why don't we find out? We click on this little button over here and click, there goes. I logged onto the internet more than 30 seconds ago and here's the companies doing a live tracking on whatever I'm doing. So don't worry about cookies. That's just part of the game. Look at what's happening behind this. The moment you log onto the internet, every single one of these parties are tracking you. Here you go, 242 parties are tracking me. And that means um, this is, this is uh, you can see where they come from, who they are. I don't even know who the hell these companies are, but guess what? Everything you do online is being tracked. When you go online, how long you go online, what you watch, what you read. Don't worry about your cookies. The cookies is a, is a side story. What you're literally doing online is being tracked, analyzed, recorded, everything you do. And the information that is obtained from it is really the primary core data that is utilized for the AI engines. I'll explain that in a moment. So how is this utilized? For those of you really worried about this, oh, don't worry, there's a little button here at the top that says tracking protection on or off, and there you go. Then, uh, or you can just load a VPN in order to ensure that no one knows what the hell you're doing. You just use the Tor browser. But, not, but enough about that for now. Let's get back to the presentation. So these entities record every single thing you do on your phone, on your, uh, on your computer. The moment you go online, you are being tracked. Benefits, yes or no. We'll talk about that in a sec. But let's uh, get back to my other presentation and then take that one step further. All right. 
So that's Lightbeam, and it shows you how many companies are tracking you in real time. All of that data is stored, and we'll show you what the benefit of that is in a moment. As I said, old Mark Zuckerberg was very proud of the fact that they track every single thing you do. Um, I, I think he wants some of those videos to disappear after Cambridge Analytica, because it showed that you as an individual can be analyzed, and your identity, connections, and content can be leveraged. They all is utilize making use of AI platforms and machine learning. I'm not going to talk about all the different types. Have you know critical? But the question was in 2016, how did America vote for his first orange president? And this is literally the challenge. And we're going to see the result in five or six days from now. But that's the voting patterns in 2016. Only a small part of the population voted for Trump. But because of the electoral college, that and this is what you see in front of you. The red normally votes Republican, the blue normally votes Democrat, and if you want to win the election, you need to focus on the 11 swing states, those in a brown color. And the small change in that ecosystem will change the ballgame. Well, it all started with this fella, a guy called Michael Kaczynski. He was at Cambridge University, um, and he created a, a, a methodology that you could identify someone's personality based on their social media interaction, the words they use, and so forth. Johan, I'm going to go back to the website and show you exactly how it works. So what's really interesting about this type of technology is that they already know all of this, all of the stuff that I'm going to share with you about you already. You know, it, it's, not, uh, it's not news, but there's a fantastic website at Cambridge University called applymagicsource.com. I'll talk about that in a second. So if you want to try it out yourself, it's Apply Magic Source, and it's like tomato sauce, not sauce like in source code. But applymagicsource.com at Cambridge University would allow you to understand what the internet community already knows about you as an individual. So by, by clicking on Apply Magic Source, you can, if you want to, link up your Facebook profile, your, your LinkedIn profile to this. This is not critical uh, if you want to play around with it. But Remember, this is what the internet already knows about you. So what I'm showing you is simply just making you aware of what they already know. So what I'm going to do, Jan, is, and everyone at the forum um, or in the meeting, I'm going to go to my LinkedIn profile, take a look at an article I've written. So um, let me take a quick look at one of the articles that I've written. And then I'm going to cut, copy, and paste that article. Why the hell am I having so much difficulty? Um, that's because I am using the, not the, one of my existing browsers. My apologies for that. So let me quickly just do a, an overview. I'm going to open up a window that you can track me on, Jan, uh, and everyone else. So my humble apologies. I'm not using Firefox as my normal browser. And therefore, I'm going to utilize a separate browser to activate what I'm going to show you. So let me open up um, my LinkedIn profile. I'll share my screen in a moment. All right. And Bobby Jean Gore. So let's take a look at some of my articles. Um, and I'm going to take one of them and copy the text from it. And by simply copying the text of one of my articles, I'm going to paste it onto this website and allow it to identify one of my personality traits based on the words I use within my article. So uh, here's an article that I wrote. Yeah, okay. So that's one of the articles I wrote. High prices paid for superior stool samples. One of my predictions for 2024, let's utilize the text that I've written and to make a copy of it. Now I go back to Apply Magic Source. I take the text that I've written, I put it in there, and I simply say, make a prediction on my personality based on my use of words and what you can get from it. Now, this might be completely different to what you would normally obtain, but yes, it's actually quite accurate. So here's the normal ocean test, the, the test that normally 
Uh, you can see I'm a very strong masculine psychology gender based on the words I've used in my article. And you can see I'm more liberal and artistic. That's correct. You can say I'm, I'm in between being impulsive and spontaneous and organized and hardworking. I'm not really that hardworking. I'm more in between the two. Am I more of an introvert than an extrovert? Hey, this is spot on. I'm more of an introvert. So strong introvert, contemplative. I'm not that competitive. I'm like average between the two. The last one, I, I'm a bit more laid back. So that's the last one is not as accurate, but still correct to a, to a large extent. So my Jungian personality archetype, INTJ, as much as I hate uh, putting people in blocks, this is quite accurate. So based on an article, they could have obtained a very deep insight into my personality. Imagine what likes and shares on Twitter or on Facebook does. Now, based on Kaczynski's work, he showed that with 85% accuracy, you can predict someone's personality in about 12 clicks, their sexual orientation in about eight clicks, and their political orientation in about six clicks. Now, this is really interesting because based on your online behavior, those so-called graphs, which I spoke about, you could then identify the political leaning as well as personality, which means you can formulate a specific advertisement that speaks to a specific personality profile. And that has been utilized to swing the election the previous round. So with having said that, let me show you what they've done. So Yuan, just double checking, all of you still online and uh, part of the conversation? Yes, Peter, we are still there. Um, yeah, I think you uh, can start wrapping up. I'm not sure where you... I will do. I've got four more slides to go and then I'm done. Great, we're listening. All right, so what did Kaczynski do? Now, Kaczynski wasn't involved in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but they utilized his research. He is now at Stanford University. So that's my personality profile on average. You can see this one was based on my uh, Twitter feeds. Very, very similar to the article I've written, you will agree. What is interesting for those of you that want to take this further, that's supply magic source. If you want to do your own personality archetype, you can follow the link at the top. I'll send that through you on if you're interested. So what the guys at Cambridge Analytica did is they utilized this ocean model, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, to determine which personality profiles are the most prevalent in voting districts that is in within swing states and even within county districts. You see in the US, they can highlight and you can see the screen in front of you exactly where you stay, who you are, uh, who are you going to vote for even before they know it? So part of that insight is this, that this is the map of Iowa, Iowa State Caucus, and they know exactly where you stay and what, who you're going to vote for by, by default, based on your user profile, your personality profiles. Now the question is, having known that, how do you swing the election? You see, you're not going to convince someone that is Republican to vote an, another party, except if they're voting for an orange president. But in normal circumstances, you kind of know who you're going to vote for. One of the interesting things is that it's your likelihood of going to vote, which is the critical key element. See, these are the individuals that are likely to go and vote. You leave them alone. Nothing's going to change their mind. What you want to do is to focus on those that are swinging towards a specific party, but are not likely to go and vote. If you are being paid by the Republicans, what you then want to do is to ensure that those that are not likely to go and vote, let's send them information to encourage them to go and vote. And those that are voting for your opponent, we want to send them information to discourage them to go and vote. And that's the game you play. And if you can do a one or 2% swing in these swing states, you determine who becomes president. So how did these guys at Cambridge Analytica do it? You see, they know exactly what your advertiser number is. So the moment you open up YouTube or Facebook or whatever website, an advertisement based on your personality profile is then being sent to you. So they created seven different advertisements. And based on your personality, that's the advertisement they'll send to you. They created another seven advertisements, if you vote for the opposing party, it will be sent to you. So here's how they played it. At a certain point in time, Hillary Clinton said something racist. She said, black men are more violent than white men. Now that is purely racist. You cannot determine someone's personality on their skin color. But she said it. And, and because she said it, 
they utilize that that video clip if you were a black voter in the US and you logged onto YouTube, guess what happened? Here popped up an ad. This is what Hillary Clinton says about black people. You don't want to vote for her, do you? Uh, so a lot of people said, I'm not going to vote for Hillary. More than 2 million black people didn't vote for Hillary, which, which voted for Barack Obama in previous years. And, and because of that manipulation of what um, were happening based on the Cambridge Analytica engines. If you were a Republican that didn't really want to go and vote, they would determine, are you kind of neurotic or are you more um, laid back? If you're more laid back, they'll have an advertisement like, you were taught by your grandfather to shoot clay pigeons. You want to teach your grandson one day how to shoot clay pigeons. The Democrats want to take away your gun rights. Don't let them. If you're more neurotic, you'll go with an advertisement. There were 15 break-ins in your neighborhood in the last month. The Democrats want to take away your right to protect yourself. Don't let them go and vote. So based on your personality, you are then fed advertisement. And they then sell you anything, Coca-Cola, soft drinks, soap, movies, and politicians. That is the reality of being tracked and where AI becomes the key to unlocking the behavior patterns that then influences your behavior. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a brief overview of the world of cookies, of tracking, of AI, and of personalized advertising. Johan, the floor is yours. Uh, all I can say is fascinating. I think everyone could not leave their screens or get their ears anywhere else. Peter Baidonke, thank you very much. That was extremely fascinating. Any questions for Peter? Kay, Kay, just unmute yourself. Okay, Kay. Um, I'd like to ask, um, is it worth turning um, or refusing to have the cookies when they come up? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the funny thing with these cookies is that they literally make it extremely difficult for them for you to say no. You know, they normally say yes or read more. And then about 11 pages down, there's a I don't want to be tracked kind of model. Um, what I normally do is I just, uh, so I've got two, two mindsets in this one. Um, do I mind being tracked? Not really, because by being tracked, I can utilize my phone to look at traffic patterns of those around me, and there's certain benefits. If I'm interested in buying something, um, I, I get the offers from the internet community that want to sell me stuff, so I don't, I don't mind. Um, if, however, you are more interested in preserving your privacy, you can utilize things like Firefox, where you can turn off the browser completely. Um, you can utilize a VPN and then you say accept the cookies and, and this will be recorded on a separate IP address and you don't have to worry about, um, you know, literally tracking your behavior in real time. So there are a variety of mitigating mechanisms you can utilize from VPNs to Tor browsers that will still allow you to say accept the cookie without your identity being compromised in any way. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Peter, just unmute yourself. Thank you. Peter, I wonder if you, if you can tell us who's going to win the election then. It's quite Oy, an interesting one. Uh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, there you go, you on in my screen being shared? Yes, I can see. So it's all about swing stats. Currently, Trump has got 125 votes, collegial votes in his pocket. Biden's got about 270. That's it. But it all depends on the swing states. So if this little needle moves 1% to the right, Trump wins. If it stays where it is or moves 1%. So if, if Biden get a 1% swing in votes, Biden will literally have a landslide at the current, uh, where it currently stands. So there's a lot more uh, states that will vote Democrat. There's a lot, far less states that will vote Republican. Everything has got to do with the swing states. So everything from Texas, Arizona, Florida, Iowa, these are the normal swing states. And, and that small deviation, small deviation in percentage might lead to a completely different result. The reason why Trump won is that it got that one or two percent shift in all of the swing states that you were tracking. And that's why he won. Uh, a one or two percent to the right would mean completely a, a, a landslide for Biden. So 
Um, that is, uh, so I'm talking about the left or right on, on my screen. My apologies if, if I mixed up my words, but I'm talking about this moving towards the left or right. And that would then show uh, either a landslide for Biden or a narrow victory for Trump. It's, it's such a go, but it seems as if a lot more people, specifically the youth, swung towards Biden early votes where, where the youth didn't really vote in the previous elections, a lot of the youth did. And the number of uh, Republicans uh, swapped allegiances and started voting for Biden. That might just be the shift he needs to, to win. So that's about all I can say. Yeah, thanks very much. Approaching the end of it, today's tutorial in the I didn't know I can do that series explains a few simple concepts about Windows. Windows, the small screens on the monitor of a Windows-based personal computer. Now, all users of a Windows-based computer use it. You cannot avoid it. So, I trust this tutorial will clarify a few simple unknowns and provide you with a few tools that will make managing Windows easier and more effective. My apologies again to the Apple user. I'm working on a plan to include Apple specific tutorials in this series um, and I hope to bring you some good news soon. Yeah, Derek, you just put your hands in the air. You might be the contributor for that, so I'll talk to you. The link to this tutorial, um, well, the, the video is loaded onto my YouTube channel and the link to that is in the survey that will follow. I'm going to paste the surveys link in the chat panel now. So while I'm talking, you can open that. Um, you can tap, uh, click on it now. The, the survey is very short. Um, there's no voting this time. It should take you less than three minutes to complete. So you can click on it now and keep it open. Um, even although the meeting has ended, you can continue to complete the survey and then submit it. Our next meeting is on Wednesday, the 25th of November. Just remember, some people always ask me when is the next meeting. It's always the last Wednesday of the month. So the next one is Wednesday, 25th November at 10 o'clock. And the two topics will be, number one, geopolitical tendencies and effects on technology. Now, I think Google and Huawei, Huawei. The second topic will be very more specific about machine learning, artificial intelligence and deep learning, something that you've also heard about today. Now, Peter will again present the first topic about the geopolitical tendencies. The second topic will be presented by Dr. Jay van Seyl. Uh, Dr. Jay van Seyl is an innovator and entrepreneur in the world of intelligent technology innovation. He's a, compu a computational social scientist with vast international business and academic experience. I will send you more information about him in the next newsletter, but I think you can gather already that he's, um, he's got also a lot to say and he's also not an introvert when it comes to presenting this. Um, he's a very interesting character. So thank you very much for all attending again to the presenters and that is the end of the meeting. You're welcome to unmute yourself and say anything or type it in the chat panel. I'll leave the meeting open for a few more minutes.